get a concern mm -hmm. and a worry about the problems in the long term. Yes. And uh, so, you know, of course, you know, if you look at the uh, increase, that's mm -hmm. quite substantial mm -hmm. uh, year over year. Mm -hmm. But looking at uh, the immigration rate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, compared with the national average, we have less than 3% of immigrants in this province. Right. Uh, national average, we have 20%. Right. So there's a lot of room to grow for this uh, province. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, uh, people have, you know, a lot of concerns about immigration in this province. You know, some say, you know, uh, immigrants may take jobs away from what they have, and some may say, you know, immigrants might drain, you know, public, you know, uh, resources, yes. right, in health and mm -hmm. social security and so on. This is a common health mess. Right. So my research really is to dispel this kind of common health yes. mess. Yeah. And just looking at employment, mm -hmm. and most immigrants coming to uh, these problems now are coming at, you know, from the immigra economic uh, immigration class mm -hmm. and uh, mostly employer driven actually. If you mm -hmm. look at uh, the provincial law mini program, mm -hmm. most recently uh, we have the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Programs mm -hmm. yeah. and one of the condition to get approval of immigration status, you need to have job offer from mm -hmm. an employer. And that means that uh, those jobs have been already advertising yes. for a considerable amount of time, mm -hmm. usually six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, if no uh, you know, uh, local workers have the qualification mm -hmm. or you know, uh, le 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 no uh, local workers are willing to take the job on ongoing mm -hmm. uh, market rates, mm -hmm. wage rates, yes. then you know, the immigrants would be accepted. Mm -hmm. So it's really here we're talking about immigrants who come here mm -hmm. uh, to fill labor skill shortages. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, not actually directly compete with local workers. This is common how to miss. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, n you know, numbers, numbers study have shown, mm -hmm. you know, there's no adverse effect of immigration mm -hmm. on the unemployment rate. Right. Uh, so this is probably one of the, uh, you know, common how to misperception. Another is that um, about the resource impl implications, mm -hmm. and because the. Uh, immigration selection system. First of all, immigrants are uh, considerably younger, right. okay, relative right. to the population, uh, local population, mm -hmm. and also they have gone through this um, uh, health screening process. Right. So that means they actually uh, more healthier, yeah. at least in the first year, mm -hmm. uh, first few years arrival. Right. That means they are less likely to utilize our public house um, uh, mm -hmm. system. Yes. The other is that, uh, you know, um, because they are younger, uh, you know, uh, on average, uh, typically would they pay income tax right away. Right. They only accept, you know, uh, receive, uh, you know, pension benefits and, you know, decades <laughs> later, <laughs> okay, or they have contributed yeah. to the mm -hmm. employment insurance system already right. before they can actually qualify mm -hmm. for employment insurance benefits. Right. So again, study have shown that, you know, immigrants are less likely to utilize those kind of uh, public security uh, resources mm -hmm. and, um, and also because the cultural dimension, right. I mean, mm -hmm. most uh, recent immigrants coming from uh, Asia Pacific countries or African countries mm -hmm. and you know in part because they don't know the system well they don't know how to apply for right. you know social right. assistance <laughs> benefits <laughs> right. or there's some kind of cultural um, right. you know biases because mm -hmm. you know for example uh, some a lot of recent immigrants are not actually uh, you know comfortable mm -hmm. implying this is so-called a shame effect so mm -hmm. really here is that if you look at the resource implication our study based on macroeconomic model has shown actually, actually uh, immigrants not only won't take jobs from our local workers or drain our public resources and they can bring in more money mm -hmm. how come that be mm -hmm. right yeah. the idea is exactly what I just demonstrated to you the you know the younger the pay income tax right away and less likely to actually utilize public uh, security resources. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we actually accept additional 1,000 immigrants to this province, mm -hmm. we actually could increase right. about $40 million to the government coffer right. based on our uh, summation uh, mm -hmm. uh, research right. um, yeah. you know, in four this uh, province. Right. Yeah, because um, even the younger they are, the more likely they are to start a family. Yes. And of course, we know that the province has an aging population. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> the big worry of the <laughs> premium desolate, yeah. Andrew right. Furry. I yeah. mean, you know, we have shrinking pop. We have aging population. Yeah. Our fertility yeah. is yeah. actually yeah. lowest in right. the country. Yes. Less than one point three five. You know, per um, you know, 
women. Mm -hmm. And the other is that we have oldest population, mm -hmm. uh, on average about 46 years old. Mm -hmm. and national average is much lower, is mm -hmm. around 40 years old. So, you know, really we need a lot of, you know, um, workers at that prime, you know, age of labor force participation, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly when actually wealthy immigrants can potentially fill labor skill gaps right. in the province. Yeah. And there's also the aspect of immigrants coming and they're entrepreneurs. They're starting their own businesses. That's companies, right. Companies, restaurants. Exactly. Uh, Again, the research has shown that, uh, uh, you know, immigrants are more likely to start up new businesses. And mm -hmm. international students are six times more likely right. to start a business. We have, at Mom, we have a very well run, actually, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship training program right. for international students mm -hmm. uh, funded by COVA. Right. And at a Janus Center, mm -hmm. you probably heard about yes, the program, the which is right, you know, yeah. well received. Right. So, exactly the idea mm -hmm. is that immigrants not only uh, you know, create jobs for themselves, but also they create jobs for locals, mm -hmm. right? Through this kind of a new startup entrepreneurship programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great that sounds a lot. <laughs> that is a good information. But uh, now you serve on the World Bank's Expert Advisory Committee on Migration and Development. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned the new premier. What would be your advice to him around immigration policies for this province? We, ha we have, as I said, we need to have a bold plan for okay. immigration right. uh, program mm -hmm. and policy in the province okay. uh, to fill labor skill shortages, to, you know, to you know, grow the population in the province for long-term economic and social prosperity of the province, and to have a bigger say and more influence at a national stage. Right. And uh, so, you know, as I said earlier, you know, this is you know pretty dramatic increase. Fifty percent of immigration intakes, about seventeen hundred by twenty twenty-two. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds impressive, but I think we can do a lot more than that because yeah. national average yeah. is one percent of population. Right. And here in this province, less than 0.3%. That means that uh, based on our calculation, we should be able to bring 5,000, at least, yes. right, to, you know, to fix this population shrink mm -hmm. and also fix this uh, labor skill shortages. Right. And we have, uh, you know, a lot of to do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of to grow in this province. Right, yes, and to increase the economy as well. That's right, <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is probably <laughs> one of the most important issues. When mm -hmm. I first actually took on this position as mm -hmm. Stefan Jaroslawski chair, mm -hmm. of course, you know, he himself is a very successful mm -hmm. uh, refugee to this right. province yes. from Germany. Yes. Uh, you know, fleeing from the oppression of Lesses mm -hmm. in the 1930s mm -hmm. and eventually become very successful. Mm -hmm. Uh, entrepreneur as, as you know investment banker and actually become a billionaire right. and uh, so he's so uh, you know gracious mm -hmm. to actually provide uh, more than 30 chairs uh, researchers yes. in yeah. the country I was okay. very lucky right. uh, to be selected right. uh, for yes. this Stefan Jaroslawski show in cultural economic transformation when he gave me this title right. he said I have special meanings for this chair okay. because you know, based on his understanding, economy mm -hmm. is the most important issue in the province. Yes. Probably most people agree. Yes. Uh, but a cultural change mm -hmm. is most challenging. Yes. Right? Yeah. It takes a long time. It takes the, you know, the, the change of the mindsets mm -hmm. before people can openly accept, mm -hmm. right, this large scale migration program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the, one of the concerns is about potential erosion of local cultures, yes. right? When newcomers come in, mm -hmm. people sometimes, you know, view them with suspicion, yes. right? Yes. Or some kind of feel even mm -hmm. in the rural remote areas. Right. Yeah. That is understandable. Mm -hmm. But I could I have a message to them is that we definitely have no evidence to show mm -hmm. uh, those kind of radical thinking, uh, radical, radical thoughts, right. you know, yeah. ideas mm -hmm. have made inroads mm -hmm. to the province or to the country. Right. And yes. if anything, I think, the, the impact of multicultural is actually opposite as, you know, what the mm -hmm. Prime Minister said, you know, right. diversity is our strength. It is. Right? Yeah. Diversity have made this province a lot more interesting, mm -hmm. a fun place to live right. and work. Yeah. Right? So if you look at the, you know, all kind of, you know, ethnic food and restaurants and music and arts yeah. and so on, right? right. Yeah. So this is where we 
we feel, right? Mm -hmm. This is actually the long-term tradition of the province, yes. right? And uh, is essentially, immigrants have contributed, okay. right, mm -hmm. to the more dynamic, more vibrant community yes. of Newfoundland and Labrador. Yep. And that's very true. Now, we are going to take a short break. And when we come back, Dr. Fang is going to talk about the employer's perceptions of hiring newcomers and international students. Welcome back to Sharing Our Cultures as we continue our conversation with Dr. Tony Fang. Great, and I was wondering when we were talking earlier about uh, immigration and people being employed here, that some employers feel that newcomers or international students might not be a good fit for their workplace, and some of them feel they even have to make um, adjustments to the workplace to accommodate the diverse populations that are uh, wanting to be employed in their organizations or companies or agencies. Now, what from your research does the data show um, are the perceptions of employers uh, on hiring immigrants or international students? Yeah, that's exactly the reason we conduct this uh, survey uh, in uh, 2019, last mm -hmm. year, between July and August. Mm -hmm. We actually surveyed more than 300 uh, employer in okay. the province. Okay. And the, the idea is that, uh, you know, uh, we know economic integration is the most important part of the long-term integration and retention of newcomers in the province. Right. Finding a meaningful job mm -hmm. that actually can support themselves and also their family. So uh, in that regard, the perception of the employee hiring towards newcomers, mm -hmm. international students is crucial. Mm -hmm. This is also crucial because uh, the federal government recently had important policy changes mm -hmm. making a shift uh, for the selection of uh, immigrants mm -hmm. uh, by federal uh, government departments, the mm -hmm. AICC, mm -hmm. more towards the regional government, also uh, allowing more uh, involvement and participation of employers, mm -hmm. which is a very important part of the labor market, which right. is a demand side of the labor market. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, and also, as we know, the recent change in program like uh, PMP, uh, mm -hmm. Provincial Law Mini Program, AIPP, Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, um, you know, does emphasize the strong role of the employers. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, based on the data, uh, what we have found is that in this province, actually, more than 43% of organizations reported mm -hmm. labor skill shortages. Uh, either because lack of applicants or lack of necessary skills or lack of necessary uh, experiences. Right. And that's where actually newcomers can actually uh, play an important role to fill such labor skill shortages. And, uh, and also quite interesting from our data, um, more than 60% of organizations received applications mm -hmm. from newcomers, international students. Right. And actually, 48% um, of them actually hire them. Mm -hmm. okay. Interestingly, you know, overwhelming majority of uh, employers reported positive experience okay. with immigrant uh, and student uh, um, employees. Right. Okay, the most important reasons for that positive impression, including strong work ethics, right. very hardworking, yeah. very reliable, yeah. had very strong qualification and skills. Mm -hmm. Of course, some of them also mentioned the areas for improvement, including language barriers right. and lack of understanding of workplace culture mm -hmm. and, uh, and also uh, higher labor mobility. That's exactly why, you know, the stakeholders of labor market, including the government, settlement agencies, and employers themselves, uh, should provide more support mm -hmm. for the uh, long-term success integration of newcomers, international students could sue, all kind of language training, mm -hmm. uh, job specific skill training, mm -hmm. and bridge programs, and also you know, cross-cultural communication and training. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, you know, we have learned a lot from uh, you know, the survey. You know, of course, first of all, you know, it's quite um, uh, impressed. We're, we're quite impressed that uh, you know, uh, the all Overall, the perception of hiring 
mm -hmm. attitudes towards uh, newcomer intelligence is quite positive. Yes. And even more positive mm -hmm. among those who already hired newcomer international student. This is the kind of lesson we have learned uh, for this province because, um, you know, it is the rural area mm -hmm. that the employer report most acute labor skill shortages. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, is the, in the rural areas, the employer have a lot of concern and suspicions mm -hmm. about suitability and the fit, and yeah. the cultural fit right. of newcomers. So that yeah. highlights the importance mm -hmm. of cross-cultural communication. Yeah. And also, you know, more transparent and comprehensive information about the purpose and the process immigration program. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I have found is that, you know, it is a small, medium-sized enterprise who lack of the knowledge about immigration program. Right. And, uh, and that's probably not surprising. Mm -hmm. We know all the large organizations, employers, they typically have, you know, very, uh, you know, strong HR department mm -hmm. who actually understand you know, all this process, immigration, mm -hmm. uh, program, and policies. Right. So, so, yeah, this is, you know, one of the kind of dilemma, uh, you know, we kind of face in this province is that we know uh, we have not a much problem for St. John's, mm -hmm. which experienced right. very healthy mm -hmm. uh, population growth during the last two census. Right. But yeah. outside of St. John's, mm -hmm. almost every community is losing people. Right. Yeah. And they, uh, they also reported skill labor shortages, but they are most hesitant yeah. in hiring newcomers mm -hmm. and international students. Right. So in that regard, we have a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the government, right. federal, provincial, municipal, mm -hmm. and also the uh, settlement agencies, right, to put in more resources, mm -hmm. more support to small, medium-sized enterprise in a rural, rural, remote areas in, in, in the province. Right. Yeah, because I think when newcomers come, they're more likely to agree to work in rural areas than maybe even the local people. So it, it's, it's a place where they can actually go and be able to use their skills, their experiences, and actually learn about the cultures. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, if you can see, you know, for those highly uh, skilled uh, newcomers, mm -hmm. you know, doctors, lawyers, and so on, many of them will, will like to start in the mm -hmm. small community because that's where they can easily find, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a community practice their, uh, their skills, right? right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still remember many years ago we have a movie about how, you know, mm -hmm. the rural communities in Newfoundland, uh, you know, would like to track and retain medical doctors right. uh, in the region by suing, you know, five dollar bill <laughs> along the road. The doctors, you know, heading back home, right? You know, yes. just you know, well, that's maybe some miracle, <laughs> right? You know, that would attract <laughs> us to stay here, right? So, but it shows, highlights the yeah. importance yes. to yes. attract, retain highly skilled professionals in mm -hmm. those communities. Yes, it is very important uh, as well. So, knowledge mobilization is key. How do we get what would you suggest or advise, how, um, well, the government, the people who employ uh, newcomers, what do they need to know to make them buy into this idea that, yes, it benefits us, the socioeconomic benefits are high, uh, you know, we, we know about the good work ethics, the number of people who come here have two or three degrees, they've got a lot of years of experience, you know, so we don't want them just to come and waste that here. Mm -hmm. How do we get that message across? Well, first of all, you know, we have uh, our responsibility as uh, researchers, uh, as academics, we should reach out mm -hmm. rather than sitting in a dark room writing papers, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, let's, you know, exactly what I, I've been doing. I mean, mm -hmm. doing this, like interviews <laughs> with the media mm -hmm. and uh, with the local organization, mm -hmm. border trade, yes. right? Yeah. And try to get the word crossed. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. The second is that the government should actually uh, play an important role to provide more transparent, more mm -hmm. comprehensive information about immigration programs mm -hmm. and assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, the third is that actually we need uh, more uh, collaborative efforts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really actually, um, you know, advocate this kind of one-stop, um, you know, service center. Mm -hmm. So, so all, you know, stakeholders, employers, mm -hmm. immigrants, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So the agencies, they could have one place to get all the information available mm -hmm. about the immigration program, about, you know, labor market information, the supply and demand, and, you know, availability of the jobs, and uh, the regions that, you know, uh, experience most uh, severe mm -hmm. labor skill shortages, right? And uh, so, yeah, so last night, I think we needed very much a concerted effort mm -hmm. to mobilize the knowledge, right. right, to share the information, right. to provide mutual support mm -hmm. so that, you know, uh, the immigrants feel comfortable mm -hmm. in settling uh, in those communities, um, employers feel the benefits and contribution made by the employees. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the government uh, have seen their tax increases, revenue increases, mm -hmm. right, in the mm -hmm. coffer, yes. right? So they will be more supportive as mm -hmm. well. So really, I think, you know, we need to come up with this, you know, idea where this is really kind of, um, you know, uh, women's situation for all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. We're all in this all together, right? right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's the main message I would like to share mm -hmm. uh, with the audience here. Yes, yeah. Okay, and we will uh, most definitely take that to heart and um, see actually how we all can work together, particularly in helping not only newcomers to come and work here, but also stay and raise their families here as well. That's right. Yeah. And that's the, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the important policy implications mm -hmm. for our study is actually we need to provide a strong support. Right to both employers and also newcomer international students. Mm -hmm. And all kind of support, including spouse employment, and accessible, uh, you know, health care, mm -hmm. more, um, you know, uh, you know uh, easy access, public mm -hmm. transportation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so on and so forth, so that, you know, uh, when it arrived, mm -hmm. right, they see, you know, everything is already set up right, yeah. for both the newcomers, but also for employers. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why the most recent program, I think it's a policy innovation it's, uh, in this country, is AIPP. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, when you sign up, employers sign up this program, mm -hmm. you actually have the obligation right. to develop mm -hmm. a settlement integration program right. for the employees, right, yeah. but also the family members. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think this is the reason why, mm -hmm. uh, you know, retention rate is improving right, yes. over time mm -hmm. for Atlantic provinces. Right, yeah. And not only attraction, of course, we mm -hmm. attract a lot more, <laughs> in, in, in part because we actually exceeded the targets of the yeah. provincial government. Yeah. It's because AIPP, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one of the program that the federal government ex would like to extend mm -hmm. for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And also, they would like to actually replicate the program mm -hmm. uh, outside Atlantic Canada mm -hmm. because it's success right. in recruitment and, and retention. Right. Well, thank you so much. You've given us so much information. I have a lot more to say. <laughs> I think uh, we are running well, out of time. Yeah, but we, <laughs> <laughs> but we really do appreciate it. And Thank uh, you for uh, inviting yeah. me. And yeah. thank you for coming, taking time there. from your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today as we had conversations with Dr. Tony Fang. Join us next time on Sharing Our Cultures as we share the contributions of individuals from around the world that have come to call this place home.
If you want convenience, Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one-stop shop for a variety of products, homestyle breads, sandwiches, plus check out our freshly baked artisan breads and single-serve desserts exclusively at our in-store bakery on Frecker Drive. With 25 locations, wherever you go, there we are. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Are you a woman experiencing abuse? Do you know a woman experiencing abuse? Help is available any time of day or night. Sheltersafe.ca is an online map that helps you find a women's shelter or transition house that meets your needs so you can live a life free from violence. Sheltersafe.ca. Help is just a click away. Eleven Eleven a new series that focuses on the supernatural, spirituality, and all kinds of mystical beliefs. Join me, Roberta Ewish, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on Rogers TV. The following program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com. Where once they stood, we stand. In Newfoundland, we remember those who came before us. Tonight, we're going to tell you some stories of the spirits that won't let us forget, because they're still here. Welcome to Tales from the Mist. On Strawberry Marsh Road, there is an inconspicuous brick government building. From its exterior, it certainly doesn't look like a home for ghosts. But as we know, looks can be deceiving. Before the Patton Building housed government employees, it was called the Exxon House, a home for developmentally delayed children. Before it was the Exxon House, it was the site of an Anglican orphanage. Lives were lived and lost inside these walls, and some of their voices remain. One evening, a staff member was working late in the office, trying to prepare for a meeting first thing in the morning. They heard what sounded like children running down the hall and giggling. I think she does. I think she sees us. She saw us. <laughs> I think she saw us. The first thought was that a colleague had returned with children, maybe just to grab a file. She continued to work and tried to ignore the children's laughter, but it continued for at least 10 minutes. Finally, she got up and went into the hall to investigate. There was no one in the hall. It was completely empty. She was sure she was hearing children, so she went to the other wing and called out. Hello? Who's in there? No response. Everything was quiet. Even louder. Who is here? She went back to her office, thinking she had missed whoever was there and really needed a break. Back at her keyboard, she had just started to write again 
when she heard giggling. Only this time it was louder. Right outside her door. She thought, one of the guys is here and trying to scare me. It's not going to work, she yelled out and tried to ignore it. Finally, she got up and looked again. No one. All the office doors were closed. No one was in these cubicles. She even went downstairs to check the login book. No one had signed in. And all the lights were off. Now she was really getting suspicious. She went back to her office and just sat there for a minute. Her skin was tingling. She remembered that this had been a home for children. Delayed children. Some had died here. Imagine someone coming to your house every day uninvited, with small crying children. No one believes you, and they don't even see or hear them. Our next story has a frustrated grandmother trying to get someone to tell the visitors to leave. To this day, we don't know if they did. Rolanda grew up on Queens Road in an old three-story house. A family lived on the main floor apartment, her nan lived in the second floor apartment, and Rolanda's family lived on the top floor. Rolanda and her sister would come home to lunch every day from school, and her nan would make them soup or a sandwich. Some days the girls would come home to lunch and their nan would greet them by telling them a lady went upstairs and to go check and, and see who it was. She would tell them that there were babies crying there all morning. Their nan was a large, assertive woman, and they would go up and look for the woman and the babies. Of course, there was never anybody up there. This routine continued for a very, very long time. It certainly wasn't every day, but frequently enough that Roland and her sister became rather used to it. Over time, their fear of finding someone up there turned to annoyance and, at some point, amusement. They thought Nan was losing it. This was the only thing that was not right with their Nan. Otherwise, she was very sane and competent. The girls couldn't understand why she kept asking them after this mysterious woman and her crying babies. Fifteen years later, at university... Rolanda's father sends her a book written by Jack Fitzgerald. Her dad had put a yellow sticky note on the side of one of the pages with a note saying, read this. Bear in mind her dad never sent her mail. This is the only thing he has ever sent her in her entire life. Curious, she opened it up to read the story. It was her old house with her old address on it. Apparently, a lady killed her two babies upstairs on the third floor in that house. They were very small, tiny little things. She had murdered them and put them in a box. She called a taxi to bring her through some wooded area where she burned the box. The taxi driver alerted the police and they found the children's little bodies. The babies that were crying in Rolanda Nan's head were those babies. And the woman, well, her soul is not at rest. They had never heard of the murders in their house. They had no idea of the history of the place until somebody gave her dad that book as a Christmas gift. 
The gift giver had no idea about the ladies and the babies that Rolanda's nan had so frequently spoken of. Unfortunately, Rolanda's nan died in 1992 and her father didn't get the book until the Christmas of 1995. Rolanda's nan died without ever knowing the real story behind her visions. The Masonic Temple is a landmark in St. John's. The building is now a performing arts center owned by Spirit of Newfoundland. But the past owners and strange rituals, basement family dwellers, have left phantoms waiting in the wings for their chance in the spotlight. Peter Halley tells us more. Yeah, the Masons lived here until six years ago. So it was, a, a, it was the, and still is, the Masonic Temple. Um, but they inhabited. Previous to getting this building, we had rented from the Masons. So we had done many shows, and uh, every now and then, one of the guys, who shall remain nameless, would let us up into the, the lodge room, and we would want to go out and play the organ there and, and just sort of get the sense and the vibe in that room, because was, there was always a a mystique about it, you know, about the whole building, of course, but that room in particular, it was, you know, not open to the public, so like school children, we had to get in that room and, uh, and you know, play Phantom of the Opera on the organ. Then we purchased the building, and uh, the very first night that we got the building, uh, the Masons had moved all of their material, all their furniture and pictures out, and we invited, you know, 40, 50 people uh, impromptu to come into the building to celebrate. We were having champagne, we got the building. And uh, so it was an idea like, how about we go up in the lodge room where people weren't ever allowed, and we did. And, uh, and it's just that energy in the room and people were asking us what the, this, uh, the tiles were for and the, uh, this, the, the eye and all the symbols. I took my dog and my friend's dog and we were explaining the, the um, the, the uh, platform in the middle of the floor, the tile. And we noticed that the dogs weren't going on that. They weren't, and we were, so we called them, come on, come on, come on. And they ran around this thing and they were like barking and everybody sort of got really intrigued and we started throwing uh, uh, cheesies and, and they really wanted to go get these cheesies but there was, they weren't gonna step on this. And, and so we were all, ooh, this is crazy. A lot of the wedding pictures that are taken here with the bride and groom, it's there are unexplained orbs around the pictures, and uh, I sort of not believed when this caretaker was telling me, you know, uh, that a lot of the brides and grooms um, had complained about these their pictures not coming out the way they wanted, and, and didn't know what these things were in the pictures, until a friend of mine got married here, and sure enough, um, all of these things in the pictures, uh, just unexplained, almost like, you know, when kids blow those bubbles looked like there were bubbles, but there weren't any bubbles in the scene, you know? They were there. I happened to be in the mall and I ran into this girl who I had known from years before and she said, how are things going at the Masonic? And, and um, I said, you know, well, we had just moved from a previous venue, but a lot of the people um, that would come to see us still thought we were at this other venue. So business that year was a little slow and transitionally it wasn't the smoothest. smoothest. So she said, you know, I'd been thinking of you and, um, you know, the Masonic, and have you ever thought about getting it cleansed? And I was, you know, we have cleaners all the time, ha ha. Um, anyway, so she made the arrangements. I didn't, I didn't talk further with her that night about it, but she called a little while later and she said that there were some priests that were coming to St. John's to do this uh, workshop uh, at Holy Heart, and there were thousands of people over two nights that were coming to do this and she wondered if they could come down and visit. I said, sure, uh, three priests and herself. And uh, they came in and myself and my business partner were here and they, they came through the building and uh, they were sort of looking at each other and, and communicating that way and we were curious about what they were saying to each other without really saying anything. 
<clears throat> asked if I was a baptized Christian, Catholic. I, I said I was. My business partner, Kathy, <laughs> wasn't Catholic. So they said, if you don't mind, we'll allow Peter to come into the room and when we go into the lodge room. So they went up there. They had their robes on. And one of them said when we came in, uh, when they walked in, they said, did you feel that? And the other priest said, I did. And one of them said, we, we don't like it. They don't like it that we're here. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. They literally did a, um, an exorcism, you know, um, and they sort of uh, cast energies out of the room and sprayed holy water and, you know, gave us some suggestions to cover up some of the, some of the symbols. Um, I sort of took it very lightly, but, you know, you're curious as well because you just don't, if someone is convincing enough about what they believe, then you go, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'll go along with that, sure. Um, and it was just after that point that everything sort of turned around for us. The energy in the building was, we thought, uh, much better. Um, business certainly turned around and has really increased and, and, you know, and sort of went on the right path almost right after that. You know, some people have come in and said they've heard music and, oh, I think I just saw someone and, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. This man was moving legal files into the building it was hired uh, by a company that was using our room for storage. And uh, several of the men had already gone up over the stairs and he came up with a box and said to this man, where do I, he hadn't been in the room yet, where do I lay these? And the guy, he said, just looked at him and then uh, he vanished. So he came down over the stairs and went outside and said, I'm not, you know, I'm not going back in there. And so we went out and investigated why, and he told us that this is what had happened. He went up with the box and he saw this guy, as large as life, in front of him, and he said, where do I put these? And he vanished. And uh, it, he was really funny. He said, you know, I need a cigarette, and my nerves are shot. Um, and this is what we've heard from a few people. He said that he was uh, a man, and uh, he was tall, and he wore a black coat. Um, other than that, that's, that was the description. And, uh, and that he, when he, he described this vanishing as, um, you know, the top part of his, of his body started to vanish and then it sort of went this way and he, he was looking, thinking, this is crazy. He dropped the box, ran over the stairs, was completely, he was completely disturbed by this, you know. He was white and he was freaked out and he was, he, he was fully convinced that he had, he had seen a ghost and he had spoken to the ghost and the ghost vanished in front of his eyes. Caretaker of the building for the last 15 years, John Warren, um, he has notions of who it is, uh, various uh, masons throughout the years. Um, I don't know, the, the building used to, um, the, the caretaker of the building used to live in the basement of this building and, and some of them raised their families here. So I think uh, the old uh, caretaker uh, caretaker of the building feels as if it was one of the people that used to live here and he's still in the building. A few times our, we get a call from the alarm company and uh, they say your alarm is stripped and um, it's happened a few times. We come down, nothing is disturbed, no one has entered a code, um, you know, and we have no explanation and that's happened, that's happened a number of times right up until last week. I got a call uh, from the company who's out of the province saying, you know, your alarm is stripped. Uh, it seems to have stopped. It came on and it stopped. So someone probably turned it off. Um, but when we came down, there was nothing disturbed and the alarm was still, you know, set. Just across the street from the Masonic Temple is another St. John's landmark. St. John the Baptist Anglican Cathedral is a beautiful example of Gothic architecture. In its courtyard is a cemetery where you may not want to find yourself alone at night. The first cemetery in St. John's was this churchyard. There are burial records for the cemetery found in the parish records. It's estimated that there are 2,000 records, but about 6,000 people are buried there. As this is the only consecrated burial ground for St. John's, Prior to 1809, many people of other religions wanted their loved ones buried on consecrated land, so they would sneak in at the night and bury the bodies, as they did not want the Church of England minister burying their Roman Catholic relatives. 
There are only a few headstones still standing. Most are buried in the ground, and a few have been moved elsewhere, to where we don't know. The present cathedral was begun in 1847 by Edward Field, the second bishop of Newfoundland. Bishop Field commissioned plans from a leading Gothic revival architect, George Gilbert Scott, who envisioned a more impressive structure with varied ornamentation in the 12th century English style. The nave, built between 1847 and 1850, served as the entire cathedral church for 35 years. Scott's assistant, architect William Hay, oversaw the nave's construction. Construction of the choir and transept section did not commence until 1880 and was completed in September 1885 under the direction of James Kelly. The additions to the nave gave the cathedral the shape of a Latin cross and continued the era of Gothic revival architecture. On July 8, 1892, the cathedral was extensively damaged in the Great Fire of 1892. The roof timbers ignited, which caused the roof to collapse, bringing the celestial walls and piers in the nave down with it. Many stone gargoyles watch the services over the years. The most interesting is that the oldest gargoyle located in the south transept is approximately a thousand years old. It came from the roof of a Bristol cathedral, a gift from the Diocese of Bristol. The cathedral also has numerous other plaques, relics, and historic pieces of stonework, as well as a museum and archives. In the archives, there is a very interesting photo. During the completion of the rebuilding, a workman fell off a scaffold and to his death. Upon completion, the crew dressed in their Sunday best and posed for a picture. They did not notice their workmate had joined them. If you look carefully, you can see him, still dressed in his work clothes. The Dean stresses that the cathedral is only haunted by the Holy Spirit. Still, take a walk around the cemetery late at night and tell us what you think. This rugged nine-kilometer island was once the center of a thriving community and cultural destination. Settled in the mid-1700s as an agricultural and fishing community, the economy expanded tremendously during the 1890s when iron ore mining began. Iron ore deposits were vast and high quality and close enough to the Cape Breton coal fields to feed the giant steel mills in Sydney, Nova Scotia. The iron mines drew Bell Island into the international network of the mining and steel industry, and over the period of mining operations, distant powers and events shaped much of the history of the mines and of the island itself. During the Second World War, four ships were sunk and 70 merchant mariners lost their lives. Bell Island was one of the very few locations in North America to see enemy action during the war and the only location in North America to be subject to direct attack by German forces during World War II. Bell Island now has a population of 3,000. Not all the island's residents are easy to see. Legends of fairies, hauntings, eerie sightings and sounds resonate through the community that even today keep the people of Bell Island cautious where they walk when the sun goes down. Henry Crane of Tourism Bell Island grew up on the island and knows its secrets and hosts the Ghost Walk every summer. When I started doing this, I started to, uh, I was really interested in ghost stories because my grandmother Hammond told me so many ghost stories and folklore and everything else. What was real, what was unreal, what was made up, etc. Uh, from then, when she passed on, I sort of like took it as a project of myself and I interviewed as many older, and I mean older people in, in the, in the uh, town as I could, uh, everybody. And they start to come with these ghost stories and these uh, entities and everything else. Uh, and then I end up doing a show with Creepy Canada and, and then uh, the Newfoundland Paranormal Society got, a, got hold to it. And then they came over here and, and they saw our ghost tour. And uh, they bought a couple of psychics with them and they spent, I think it was three nights all together over here on Bell Island. 
And by the time they were finished, they deemed this area that we perform our hauntatorium, which we didn't think of as the time, but we knew it was creepy. That's why we picked this area. Uh, they deemed it the most haunted part of North America, not only of Belle Island or Newfoundland or Canada, but in all of North America. So we've had people who come through here, walk through here and say, you just get this creepy feeling, like somebody's always watching you or you get nervous, like somebody is almost going to jump at you, something like that. So we we were glad that we picked this area. Maybe it wasn't so much as uh, fate as was destiny to come here and do it. The Haunted Tour itself uh, features uh, five talking ghosts, uh, some of them very, very benevolent, some of them very evil. Uh, our first ghost that the people meet when they do the haunted tour is uh, the ghost called John the Miner. Uh, I believe 107 miners were killed down here over at, uh, from 1895 to 1966 when the mines closed. Uh, any miner who was killed in the mines, the folklore has it that if that person were killed in the mines, they could, their spirit never leaves the mines. Uh, we meet a, a ghost called the White Woman. Uh, people call it these days the Woman in White, but that w was actually the White Woman. It's based on a true story. Uh, back in the 1940s, late 1940s, a young woman was killed. She was murdered, uh, and and she was thrown in a well. And like you, you know, you wind up the bucket, and you that's how you get your water. Back in those days, in the 1940s, again in this area. Part of this area here had all wells on it. Now, for people to get, there was no running water, there was no hot water, there was no baths, there was no showers. So people got their water, and this is where this couple met. And she was a young, beautiful young girl. Uh, she and there was about 16,000 people on Belle Island. She started to take up with this man, and eventually she found out he was married. And when she confronted him, he wasn't going to give up his wife, and he actually strangled her and threw her in the well. From there, we move on to another uh, ghost again who's rather, rather benevolent. A boat came in and, and a vicious winter storm. The boat was lost with all hands and was supposed to have been lost on this side of the island and it was headed out into Harbor Grace or Carbon Air um, and there was children on it. And there was apparently a school teacher who was looking after those kids, bringing them, 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 all, bringing them all over. The fairies, right? She is the queen of the fairies. She can look like you. She can look like the grass, she can be like the concrete. She's an entity. She moves from where she wants, does what she wants. She reports, she's, she, is, she has no master, and she'll tell you, no master, no mistress, and no equal. She fears nothing and nobody. She takes what she wants, when she wants. And from there we go to the uh, Ghost of Dobbins Garden, which is again is a great story, based in fact, and then it takes off into folklore. If a farmer was by himself, by himself, Right? As the sun sets, if anybody, one person, as the sun sets, they're likely to see the ghost of Dobbins Garden. And she'll tell you that you will now feel what she felt. No one came to help her, no one will come to help you. We hope you've enjoyed these tales. The next time a shadow moves in the corner of your eye, just out of sight or you hear something you can't explain, just remember to tell a good story about it. <laughs>